Christ the shepherd to seek out from every land fallen and reap all your sinners long before the world began overwhelmed with deep compassion for his sheep astray and lost he devised a rescue mission that would take him to the cross with the love of christ constraining we will live for him who died till his name among the nations be made known and glorified oh the call of christ the savior to propel his ransomed ones to go forth in gospel power to all people tribes and tongues millions die with no salvation half the world untold and lost boldly go across the nations and preach nothing but the cross with the love of christ constraining we will live for him who died till his name among the nations be made known and glorified oh the grace of christ the sovereign to receive all round his throne distant souls from every nation once estranged but now his own bound by blood will stand together unified by love's great cost with one voice we'll sing forever thank you jesus for the cross with the love of christ constraining we will live for him who died till his name among the nations be made known and glorified with the love of christ constraining we will live for him who died till his name among the nations be made known and glorified. Let's take our Bibles now and turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Thank you so much for that special in song and thank you for everything and all the music throughout the week. Romans chapter 1. Find verse 15 if you would. Romans chapter 1, find verse 15. Let me encourage you this week to be able to get a hold of materials that will stir your heart for missions, stir your heart for souls, and uh, really will um, continue to uh, fuel that flame. Uh, you know, it's great to be able to get together for a conference maybe once uh, a year or once every two years or whatever, but uh, the Lord's burden and his plan is all the time, and uh, so may this continue in our hearts. I think of uh, books from John R. Rice that have just absolutely impacted my life. Uh, Personal Soul Winning is a small pamphlet. Uh, these are easy, to, quick to read, but it'll stir your heart. Uh, winning Our Loved Ones to Christ, How Do You Share the Gospel with Someone That You Love? There's another small pamphlet uh, that's uh, Getting the Soul Winner's Heart. Uh, very, very helpful. And uh, so I want to encourage you with those. There's books back there that'll challenge ladies as well. There's ladies' Bible studies. You can ask my wife about that. And it says, uh, your faith affects your family. Uh, ladies, your faith does affect your husband, your, um, uh, your family. And so there's uh, just great books back there. There's a pastor's wife that wrote those. Um, your faith affects your family. It'll challenge you. Uh, let me encourage you uh, as well to, to thank the, not only the missionaries, but also the missionaries' wives. And uh, they've given up so much, and there's such a, a great support uh, to them. Uh, wow. What a great conference, isn't it tremendous? And I'm just so thrilled uh, to be a part. Um, I'm thrilled uh, so many things. Uh, we had great food, didn't we, folks? <laughs> uh, 
I don't know who made that guacamole that first night, but I'm going to strap them to the back of our trailer. <laughs> and every time we want guacamole, it's okay, all right, here's your chance. <laughs> here, here it is. That was awesome. I wanted to dive in, you know, and just eat it. It was just great. Uh, but the food has been outstanding, and uh, thank you for that. Last night, the gifts, <laughs> wasn't that overwhelming? Yep. Can I say for all the missionaries, uh, a thank you, um, a gratefulness to God for you, and um, that was just tremendous, and um, we shouldn't have been a part of that. We just are so grateful. We were one of those difficult ones to extract that information out of <laughs> uh, for a couple of reasons, but, um, um, but we, um, we are so thankful for that. Uh, thank you for, uh, to Brother Reed, Brother Bob Reed. The, I don't think the man sleeps. Um, <laughs> Brother Bob, is, is he here right now? He's not. He's sleeping right now. <laughs> I caught him. I caught him. He's out sleeping. You know, if he could just sing out just a little bit more, you know, um, <laughs> He could be, man, wasn't that great, the song leading, and uh, get you to sing out. I love it. Uh, but uh, him and Miss Tanya, uh, and uh, thank you for your service to the Lord. Um, and let me say, I love Pastor Stan Slayball. And uh, now I get to, we get to know Miss Kathy this week, full of grace, and I think just real folks, real people. And uh, they're just pouring into us uh, all week long. And we're the ones that are supposed to be pouring into you and be a blessing. And thank you so much. Um, there's, no, there's no question in my heart why this church has an emphasis on missions. Because your pastor has a heart for missions. And he has a heart for God. And so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, we're so thankful, so grateful. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, find verse 15 and 16. Um, if you're able to stand, would you stand with me one last time out of respect of God's word, Romans 15, Romans 1, verse 15 and 16. The Bible says this, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The title of the message this evening is in verse 15, I am ready. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, would you please get us to a readiness to give the gospel, a readiness to support the gospel, a readiness to give our very lives. Lord, I pray, would you, Spirit of God, right now take control Get us to the next place of readiness that you want us to, to be in. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I think we're standing. You may be seated. In college, I prayed for a friend, and uh, God gave me a dear friend. He's uh, now with the Lord, uh, but uh, his name was Colin. He was a uh, large uh, Idaho farm boy. He was big. He was muscular. He was outgoing, and he was ready at a moment, a drop of a hat to be able to uh, go serve the Lord. He, uh, for me, it's plan, think it out, then let's do it. For him, it's let's do it and think about it later. And, uh, and I tell you, we, we went to Caracas, Venezuela together, and I said, okay, let's go out. We're going to go uh, do some street preaching. Okay, let's get this plan, and who's going to do what, and what we're going to do. He was like, let's just go do it, brother. <laughs> and uh, I remember I went out there, and uh, the first time, that was the first time, and uh, I said, Attention! The interpreter I looked to him, and he didn't say anything. Then I said, I'm out on the streets, okay? We're just trying to get a crowd together to, to preach to them. I said, attention! Still nothing. Attention! Then finally I looked over, and the interpreter goes, okay. Attention! Attention! It's like it's the same thing, it, it just it's slightly different. And uh, so we, we, we did the preaching, and uh, but it was just tremendous. But I remember... Um, in college, he, he, uh, uh, he said, hey, would you go with me to this outreach? It's downtown. I said, okay. It's on a Friday night. I'm like, mm, I don't know. And downtown Friday night was not a real good place. He said, uh, okay. And the leader said, we're supposed to stay on this one main drag, this one main road. It was well lit. 
Everywhere else off this drag is just, it's dark, it's bad neighborhoods, you just you shouldn't go there at night. And we're on there, and uh, they even said, don't bring money, you know, because you don't want to get mugged, or you don't want to say that you have money, and someone, you know, just get in trouble, so don't bring money. Well, I forgot I had my wallet in my pocket. I had like five, ten dollars or whatever, and, and uh, so uh, we're on the main drag, and Colin said, hey, I know a place we can go. And we go off the main drag. I said, I thought we we're supposed to stay here. <laughs> so we go off this, uh, the main uh, place. And it's dark. You know, it's night time. It's, it, it, and it's just a bad neighborhood. We're knocking on doors. People aren't answering. Who is it? Go away. You know, uh, because they were scared because of answering the door in their neighborhood at night. I don't blame them. And uh, finally, we're walking around one corner. And um, it was a questionable establishment. I don't know if it was a liquor store or what it was, but it had bars on the windows, bars on the door, and from the overhang in the front door, it had one little incandescent light just swinging there. <laughs> you know, kind of get the mode here. It was dark all around, parking lot across the street from us was all dark, and we come around the corner, there's two guys are there. And uh, I went, oh boy, here it goes, we're in trouble now. And, uh, but we got in conversation with them, we started giving the gospel, they asked, do you have any money? I'm not going to say a thing. And Colin says, yeah, I, well, I don't have any. Chris, do you have any? Like, no. <laughs> you know, I had five bucks, which is like $500 to a college student. And he said, I'll pay you back. And uh, so he gives me the money. And as soon as he gives it to the men, they just take off. They didn't want to hear about the Lord Jesus. They didn't want to hear what we had to say. But they just took off. Well, as soon as they took off, this entire time, we had been watched from across the street in this parking lot, this dark parking lot, headlights came on, and also lights on top of the car came on. And it came over to us, and one officer said, hold it right there to us. Another officer ran around the corner to them and grabbed those two guys. They thought we were doing drugs. I said, no, we're just telling them about Jesus. <laughs> you know, Golan always had a readiness to give the gospel. We've been going throughout the week, and we've been learning throughout the book of Acts that a revived church is a missions church. The Bible said the, to wait for the promise to the disciples, didn't he? And to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to be given. We talked about that throughout the week. And, and let me ask, are you ready now? Are you ready? Are you ready yourself are you ready to support missions? Are you ready to give of yourself? First of all, are you ready to give the gospel yourself? If we're going to be a missions church, a missions-minded church, if we're going to be part of what God has planned, it's not just a matter of someone else doing this and we hear about their presentations. We must be ready to give the gospel. Look, if you would, at Romans 1, 15 and 16. It says this, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Let's explain what that means. <clears throat> what does gospel mean? Gospel means the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is the death, the burial, and the, rection, uh, and the resurrection of Lord Jesus. As was shared by Brother Callahan in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. According to the Bible, not to Baptist, not to a denomination, but according to the word of God, we can say, thus saith the Lord, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. That is good news. And he says, I am not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus tonight. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, this good news that has saved my soul. If you're here and you've never trusted in the good news of Jesus Christ, you can be saved tonight, today, right now. You can have your sins forgiven. You don't have to have this question, am I ready to die? You can know that you're on your way to heaven. He says, I'm not ashamed. The word ashamed here means disappointed. Whenever the word is given throughout the word of God, it's the idea of disappointed. It's like, you know, I tried something, but I really is really disappointed with that. You know what? The gospel is ready right now. Are you ready to give that gospel? It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power 
of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That means this, God's power is powerful enough to save you, to save anybody. Do you believe that tonight? And it's, how do you get this power? This power of the gospel is this dunamis, this dynamite power. Uh, when we were kids, we would light off fireworks, and uh, we would uh, get that firework, and we'd light it off, and every once in a while, we'd get a dud. You light it, and then you're like, okay, do, do we get it, you know, and you're just, okay, is it going to go off, is it going to be delayed? Oh, man, I'm so disappointed. It was a dud. The gospel is not disappointing. I don't have to be ashamed. It is powerful. How do you detonate the gospel? It says right there in verse 16, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. If you're here tonight, would you simply believe on Jesus Christ? Place your faith, your dependence on Jesus Christ, and he'll save you. As a Christian, would you say, I'm, what, I'm ready to give this gospel, this powerful dynamite gospel to other people. There's a fisherman, and he was fishing with dynamite. He was throwing dynamite off, and and uh, they're like, what in the world? I can't believe you're doing that. Finally, uh, the warden came over and said, you cannot be fishing with this dynamite. He's, he's lighting dynamite, and he's, and he's throwing it overboard, and the fish are floating up, and he's gathering the fish, putting it in his boat. He says, you can't do this. And uh, he lit another stick of dynamite and handed it to the warden and said, are you going to talk or fish? <laughs> <laughs> Look, the dynamite's right there. It's lit. Just give it out. <laughs> the gospel is powerful. When we realize that, powerful enough to save anyone. The, the, we, the harvest, the gospel is ready. The harvest is ready. We learned about that today. The harvest is ripe and ready to harvest. That means there's people ready to be saved right this minute. Are you ready to give the gospel? Go by faith in the power of the gospel the, that it's ready. There is a ready harvest. And the Holy Spirit's ready to lead you to them. Are you ready to do that on your own, yourself? God can use you. An evangelist, a missionary, is not endued with this special thing. We're zapped where we can give the gospel, but you can't. Every single person ought to be given the gospel. And a readiness with the full of faith with this. I remember just this year in June, in June as part of a Michigan Revival Conference, God is doing some great things there. It's going to conclude with a, a statewide conference in uh, Bridgeport, Michigan in November, and I'm looking forward to that greatly. And I was a part of that uh, conference and some of the earlier conferences this year. And uh, as we were doing so, God was doing a work in my heart and my life, and the one section of the conference was finished. It was done on a Wednesday night where I was heading back to the hotel room and I had in the back of my mind, kind of like maybe you do at the end tonight, this is the final service, that it's, all, it's, it's over. You know, it, you know, will it continue? What God's working and doing in our hearts, will it continue past this conference? And I had in my mind, this is over. I thought, you know, that is Satan putting that in my heart and my mind. I said, no. And literally, I, I'm getting out of the car, and I said out loud, it is not over. I walked, instead of through the front door of the hotel, I went to the side doors, just a little bit easier, getting to my room, and there was a guy out there having a smoke. And I said, hey, comfortable evening, isn't it? And he said, uh, yeah, but it's a little cool to me, actually, being where I'm from. So where are you from? Where, where you live? He said, Florida Keys, Key West. What are you doing in Michigan? So I used to live in Michigan. I moved down to Florida, Key West, and, but I'm up here for my daughter's graduation. I said, wow, and yeah, I'm going through a hard time. I said, yeah, it was difficult with our kids graduating and seeing them transition. But then he started opening up and seeing some other things. He's going through a really difficult time. His name was Rob. And I said, well, Rob, God just directed me to ask this question. I, I normally don't ask this this way. I said, are you a religious man? He said, well, yes. I said, Rob, I don't think this conversation is by accident. He leaned forward and he said, I thought that as soon as you walked up. <laughs> and uh, so I, I said, you know, Rob, in order to get help with your problems, you need to know for sure that you have everlasting life. Do you know if you died right now that you go to heaven? What would you say if God said, why would I let you into heaven? And, well, I don't know. I said, well, what would you say? Well, I hang my hat on the Ten Commandments, and I'm a pretty good person. 
and I've been baptized. He was all trusting what he could do. No one has ever got to heaven everlasting life that way. It is all by trusting Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can be saved. I showed him Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It was dark. They couldn't read the Bible. It was pretty small. So I had my iPad, and I just pulled it up on my iPad. And it's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And explained what it was faith in Christ. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as I was explaining to him that you need to trust Christ as Savior, I was illustrating it's like trusting uh, you're a drowning in the water and you're calling out for a lifeguard and I said you need to trust Christ as Savior and he looked down and he said oh and not yourselves that's what I'm doing right in the middle of my conversation he saw it right from the word of God and I continued to explain to him and he just stops me he said Chris just tell me what to do <laughs> just tell me what to do and he prayed he believed on Jesus Christ as Savior right then I said Rob, I said, I don't believe this was by accident. God got us together. He said, that is more true than you ever know. He said, can I read you an email? Can I read you the same email tonight? He sent this email. He was going through such a difficult time, but he sent this email to a Baptist pastor he's never met. And it happened to be an independent Baptist pastor not too far from this area. He said, my name is Rob, and I was hoping to connect with you and seeking some guidance and much-needed prayer. I need help. The man I perceive myself as, the one I strive to be, seems so far out of reach for me lately, and I'm not sure what happened or where to start writing myself. I've had some eye-opening experiences lately. I've come to the realization that my self-image is not in line with what I project. That was a difficult realization to come to hard to swallow and admit. I see it now, though. It wasn't long ago I felt pretty good and grounded and centered and projected the same. I, felt, I feel lost in a sense. I feel lost. I've heard the lo ones I love the most. He explains some specifics. Then he says, I want to be a better man. I want to be the man I see myself capable of being consistently. I come to you somewhat broken, and I'm not sure what so sure you are willing to help. I'm not sure where to start, but I figured this email was a good first step. He sent that to an independent Baptist pastor, but he couldn't meet with him that night, that day. But the pastor said, there's a conference just three minutes from your hotel. Go to that conference at 7 o'clock tonight. Well, he fell asleep, and he missed it. He's sitting outside. He goes, that's it. I can't believe it. I need help. I need help from God. I don't know where to start. And I just blew it. I just slept through, and I didn't go to that conference. They couldn't help me. And all of a sudden, some guy in a suit comes walking from that very conference he was told to attend. <laughs> An evangelist. You know, God was getting that man ready. Rob, but God was getting me ready as well. He trusted Christ as Savior. The next day we met for breakfast, and I gave him a discipleship course, a lesson right there, and met his son and gave him the gospel. And Just amazing. We keep in contact with each other via email. You know what? God is ready to do a work. Are you ready to give the gospel? That same week I was asking the Lord, okay, God, I'm ready now. I'm ready to give the gospel. I knew on Saturday um, I was without my son's coffee, so I was going to go to a coffee shop. And I said, God, at this coffee shop, would you save somebody? Now, normally I don't pray that. I pray, Lord, would you direct me, help me be a witness? But sometimes God just gives initiation in my spirit to go ahead and ask by faith that someone will be saved. And I'm ready. And I was watching. I was ready. I had my, the DVDs, that, the gospel DVDs that we have, and I was passing them out to people, and every pot, anybody that comes in, I'm watching, I'm giving them tracts, and every single person received something that day, gladly. No one rejected it. They're from Michigan. You know, could you imagine? Now, you people kind of understand here. <laughs> but they were re readily receiving. But no one was saved. I didn't even get to go through the gospel with anybody. 
went to lunch with the, the preacher that was the host of the conference. We went to Cracker Barrel afterwards. Still giving out some tracks and DVDs. I had one gospel DVD left. I'm leaving out the door. As I'm leaving out the door, I can see the guy in this blue collared Cracker Barrel shirt. I said, uh, hey, are you finishing work? Leaving? He said, no, I wasn't working. I just came in to see if I was supposed to work. This was a divine appointment. I started to explain to him that, I said, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about going to heaven, but I have a little DVD here that can explain how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. You can know ahead of time. And uh, some people think you have to be good. He said, oh, yeah, you have to be real good to get to heaven. I said, got him. <laughs> and uh, so I showed him the verses, showed him Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's not by works. It took a long time. He didn't understand that Jesus died for all of your sins. He didn't understand that what the resurrection was about. He didn't understand that it wasn't good works. It took me a long time. But finally and eventually that day, Gary trusted Jesus Christ as Savior right there in the parking lot. You know what? It took me being ready all day and during the coffee shop, during the lunch, to be able to see that one saved later. You know, a lot of times we see, we want God to say, okay, God, I want you to see, help us to see someone saved on Saturday visitation right here between 10 and noon. Because at noon we have to go to lunch, okay? And uh, Lord, I want someone to be saved right here. But what he wants is you to be ready. Are you ready to give the gospel? Number one, are you ready to give the gospel? Number two, are you ready to give financially? Would you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6? 1 Timothy chapter 6. Would you understand if you're here and you're saved and you're a part of this church, this is for you. If you're a guest, this is uh, not what we're asking for you. Uh, we certainly want you to enjoy this service, but this is... Uh, for the ones here uh, that are attending and members of this church. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse uh, 18. In fact, look at verse 17. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in their uncertain riches. Uncertain riches but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready, watch this, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. Ready to distribute. I have some funds God has blessed me with financially. I need to be ready to distribute that to others. The Bible says in Malachi 3.8, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. You say, wherein have we robbed thee? God said, in tithes and offerings. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, and if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God wants you to distribute in order to receive. It's the opposite. The world says, no, you grab all that you can for yourself. You make all the money you can for yourself. Keep it for yourself. No, are you ready to give? No, I don't believe you should give a tithe after it's taxed. I believe it's before. I believe uh, of everything that you receive, uh, you'll be able to do that. And then beyond that, give as well. Are you willing to do that type of financial giving? God, I'm ready to give to others. Now, it says that those that are rich in this world, in our standard, we look to other people and say, well, I'm not rich because I don't make a million dollars a year. You know, you go to any other country and folks, you and I are rich. We have so much. We get three meals a day. We get clothes, enough to wear. We get so many things. We have so much. Well, you see this giving is a matter of trusting the Lord and sowing. You distribute, you put out, and it's just like that seed that is sown. It is going to come back. 
Luke 6.38 says this. Luke 6.38, a great promise on giving. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, wherewithal it shall be measured to you again. You give, and it shall be given. God is saying, would you give, you, give the tithes, give the offerings, and I'll pour you out a blessing. When my children were young, uh, they would, uh, <laughs> I remember they would love to eat the Cheerios. You know, the regular, plain, boring Cheerio, right? And uh, you put it on their high chair, and they grab it, and they're, arm, arm, you know, and they're slobbering everywhere, and they're getting the Cheerios, some in their mouth, some all over, and they're little, and I'd pour out some Cheerios for them. And then I would do this. I'd say, give Daddy a Cheerio. Give Daddy a Cheerio. What would they do? they grab all the Cheerios they could do. They'd stuff them in faster. <laughs> no, mine. You know, and they're, they're, good. they're throwing these Cheerios in their mouth. You know, they got their little grubby, slimy, slobbery hands all over these Cheerios. Do I really want one of their slobbery Cheerios? <laughs> no. I poured out the Cheerios. Give them ten. Would you just give me one? Just give me one. No, mine, mine. Do I really need their Cheerios? No. I've got the whole box of Cheerios. I've got the whole box. I don't need their one little slobbery Cheerio. I've got the whole box. They would just give me one back. I'm ready to pour out some more. How often... We go through life, no, I can't do this, I can't do that. No, I wouldn't be able to give the tithe. I wouldn't be able to give above the tithe. I wouldn't be able to give to missions this way. No, I can't do that. And we grab onto what's not even ours. It's from God, the living source. And we put our trust in uncertain riches instead of the living God who provided. He is the source of all of this. And you say, I don't know if I could give it back to him. Does he really need the Cheerios? You know what? God has the whole box of Cheerios. And if you give back, what do you think he'll do? Pour you out some more. That you're not, ready, you're not room enough to receive it. God's ready. He's waiting. Are you ready to distribute? That is to give out and to trust God. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if you faint not. Sow and you will reap. Will you be ready to give? Are you ready to give the gospel yourself? Trusting that the gospel is powerful. There are people ready to be saved. The harvest is ready. The Holy Spirit's ready to use you. Are you ready to give financially to whatever missions, whatever evangelistic effort that God directs you to do? But finally, are you ready to give yourself? Look at 2 Timothy. You're right there in 1 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy Chapter 4 and verse 6. 2 Timothy 4. Find verse 6. Look if you would even at verse 5. 2 Timothy 4 verse 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, here Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. The idea of ready to be offered is the idea of to pour out, almost like the pour out offerings that they would have. He's saying this, is I'm ready to, to die. I'm ready to die well. You know, I want to die well. I want to go through going, oh, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. I know when I die, my soul, my spirit is secure. I'm going to heaven. There is no doubt. Do you know that? But so many times, even though we know that, we grab onto this world. We want all these things and all this stuff. Look, folks, we are a creature created with this living soul that's meant far beyond this. Where are we going to be in 100 years? Perhaps the millennial reign. How about in 1,000 years? How about a million years? 
How about in 100 million years? Where are you going to be? If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible says, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You'll be in a burning lake of fire forever and ever. Don't go there. But dear Christian, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. You can sit here on a Sunday night and go, I know for sure I have eternal life. That's wonderful. But are you ready to die? Could you say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, 20 and 21, According to my earnest expectation, my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Jim Elliot was ready to die. Amy Carmichael wrote A Chance to Die. Why are we so afraid of that? Why can't we get God's perspective on eternity? Get away from our American dream. Say, dear God, I'm ready. I'd rather die giving the gospel than to have a selfish, self-focused life just going all for me. Bill Borden was born to a very wealthy family. He, uh, on his 16th birthday or about that, for high school graduation, his a trip around the world. It's incredible. He could have gone anywhere, done anything. He went to Yale University. This was back in the 1800s, I believe, and maybe 19, early 19. And, um, and Yale University was actually training ministers and servants of the Lord at that time. And he went there and it's because he felt called to ministry. People said, why are you going? Why are you doing that? You're going to waste your life. And he wrote two words in his Bible. No reserves. That is, I'm not going to hold anything back from God. Whatever God wants me to do, there's no reserves. I'm ready to give all for the Lord Jesus. He wrote him in his Bible. He went off to Bible college in, or the Yale University, and as he did so, he started a, a prayer meeting. Students would gather together, and they'd pray every morning. First, there were just a handful. Then there was a dozen. Then there was about 20. Then there was 50. Then there was 100. And then there was about 1,000 students meeting every day, praying for souls to be saved, for God to work in a great, mighty way. As um, he continued on, they would have outreaches, and they would say, oh, who would go over here to the down and outers, the, the ones on drugs, and the ones on Skid Row, and the, one, the drunkards in the, in the, the, um, the alleys, and he would volunteer. The richest of them would go to the poorest of them. He was offered, even at that point, high-paying jobs with promising careers, in large companies. People knew his family, knew the stock that he came from, knew the potential that he could have. He had a great, brilliant mind. But he said no. And he wrote down two more words in his Bible. He wrote down, after no reserves, he wrote down no retreats. I'm not going to go back on what anything that God would call me to do, God would have for me to do. I'm ready to give myself no retreats. He went off to the mission field, and it, he was there for just a brief time, not long at all, and he contracted bacterial meningitis, and he died. Age, I think, 26. People asked, was his life a waste? Couldn't he have done something else with his money? He went to the mission field? Well, let's let him answer, because after he found out that he had this death blow of a disease, he wrote two more words in his Bible. Under no reserves and no retreats, he wrote down, no regrets. 
I have no regrets. I do not regret giving my life to the Lord and even dying on the mission field for him. No regrets. Say, Brother Miller, ask even these missionaries, do you regret giving your life to the Lord? Every single one will look you square in the eye and say, not at all. And I'm ready. Are you ready to die? Ready to say, dear God, whatever it is, I'm willing. I'm ready to give the gospel. I'm ready to give financially. I'm ready to give myself. Would you tonight say, I'm ready? Could you do something different tonight? God spoke in your heart and got you this week to readiness to be able to be a part of worldwide evangelism and missions. In a moment, will you tell someone about that and pray about that on your own? In just a moment, I'm going to ask in the invitation for pastor to be on this center aisle. I'm going to ask Brother Fitzsimmons, would you be over here at this aisle? And Brother Callahan, would you be at this aisle over here? I know some is a little tight. But would you do this? Would you, if God spoken to you in one of these areas, come in just a moment and take your pastor by his hand or Brother Fitzsimmons or Brother Callahan over here and just tell him those three words, I'm ready. Maybe for you it's I'm ready to give the gospel. I haven't been doing that like I ought to, but I'm ready. I'm full of faith. I want God to use me. I'm ready to give the gospel. Maybe for you it's to go to the next step financially. Say, I'm ready to give financially. Maybe you say, I, I've been so scared. I've been so held back. I'm ready to give myself. God's spoken to you in some way. Just say to them, I'm ready. After you tell them, would you men pray with that person briefly? And then I'd like you as an individual not to pray with the pastor or the missionaries, but would you on your own afterwards just find a place to pray? Does that make sense? So you can come to the man, the gentleman that you choose, whichever. Just tell them, shake, by the, shake their hand and say, I'm ready. Let them, you want to say, I'm ready to give the gospel, I'm ready to give financially, I'm ready to give myself, whichever one or all three. Just tell them, and let them pray for you. After they pray for you, would you find a place and pray on your own, and then you could just be seated. If you're here and you're not ready to die you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, would you step out and come and tell pastor or someone here, just either aisle, and say, I need to be saved. I'm not ready, but I'm ready to be saved. I'm ready to be saved tonight. Would you do that? Everyone standing, let's bow for prayer. Men, would you be ready if, at this point? Heavenly Father, I pray for your help right now. Would you please work in our hearts and our lives? Lord, help us to be ready to give the gospel to give financially and to give of ourselves. Dear God, we know as we do so that we'll have no regrets in eternity. Lord, I pray just right now that you would do that type of work in our hearts and our lives.